It is so unique, that feeling when you're inside a float tank where it's quiet and warm and you're weightless and you're naked and you're breathing and everything is okay. Most people have never experienced that level of, of lowering their stress and adrenaline to, a, to that baseline. And so, yeah, I've said in the past, when you're beginning to redline, when you're beginning to just like knee jerk buy a cheeseburger or knee jerk you know, drinking a bunch of, for drinking a bunch of alcohol, if you can picture and have a reference point for that re level of relaxation, you know, your, your subconscious mind remembers that they know your, your brain knows what that feels like. And if you can just close your eyes, hopefully not while you're driving, just close your eyes for a quick second and just like put yourself back into the float tank for a second and feel what that feels like. You can think more clearly. You can make better decisions for yourself. You can be actually a better person. Today's episode is brought to you by your friends over at juve.com. Leaders in light therapy, also known as photobiomodulation, which is a big fancy way of talking about how light impacts your own biology in the comfort of your own home. So listen, this is an amazing strategy that you can do every single day to optimize your hormone levels, stimulate collagen production, enhance recovery. If you have soft tissue injuries, if you have mitochondrial related issues, this photobiomodulation and the specific wavelengths that the juve light garners to your body has a lot of health promoting effects, a lot of science back this up. It's another way to support those mitochondria, those intracellular organs that help you generate energy. So it's something that I always recommend to clients. I do this when I travel, I do this at home. My wife does it every morning. We recommend it to everyone. It's a really cool tool. So you too can optimize your own biology using light in the comfort of your own hotel room or your own home, depending upon which unit you get by going to Juve, dot com forward slash mike that's j-o-o-v v dot com forward slash mike if you forget that if you're listening to this links will be below in the description check that out and also be sure to use the coupon code h-i-h at checkout where you can get some free swag over at juve.com so let's cut back to it with sean mccormick and talk all things float tanks sensory deprivation mindset photobiomodulation we talk about that as well in this episode psychedelics and a bunch of cool stuff it's a really fun show here we go Sean, thanks for coming out. Thanks Great for having me. Great to connect with you. Yeah, yeah, this is exciting. For sure. So you got into floating and float tanks long before they became popular. I think you said when you started your business, there was 35 tanks in the country. Um, that's remarkable. So back in 2012, I mean, now I think like in pretty much every major city, even in, in Canada and so forth, there's tanks everywhere. Um, but maybe let's kind of talk about like sensory deprivation, mm -hmm. the default mode network, the brain. Maybe like rewind the clock a little bit. Like how'd you get so fascinated with the brain? Yeah. So I, I've been a lifelong meditator. My hippie parents taught me transcendental meditation when I was 12 because I could not sit still. Uh, and they were looking for solutions for me to like regulate myself. And so I had a, an ongoing meditation practice for a while, spotty into my teens and then into college. And I was, my meditation practice sort of like sputtered a little bit. Uh, and as I was reading more and more into sort of uh, the, the effects on the brain of mindfulness meditation, I kept coming across these references to sensory deprivation. Because mm -hmm. just to back up, sensory deprivation, flotation tanks, isolation tanks, it's all, it's all the same thing. So I it kept coming up over and over and over. And I had seen the movie Altered States mm. from 1984 or something when I was a little tiny guy. Uh, it's based on John Lilly's work. This guy like goes into a float tank and eats a bunch of weird stuff and like turns into this like murderous proto human thing. So like my frame of reference culturally for the float tanks kind of went way back, but I was really curious about deepening my meditation experience. You know, that, that sort of blissful depth of, of a practice. And during that time, I was kind of, you know, I had some sort of turmoil in my life in your early 20s and finally found a float tank in Seattle. I was shocked that there wasn't one, a float center. Uh, and so I found a guy on Craigslist, this guy in Bellevue, um, and went to his house and took my lunch break in my suit and tie back when I was in sales and went over and floated at this guy's house and had an out of body experience. Hmm. Um, my first time. And it was the second time that I had ever had an involuntary OBE, but I projected out of body and had this like mind blowing experience. And it was actually so big for me that it took years for me to sort of process everything. Uh, 
So five years later, as my wife and I were exploring like what we wanted to be when we grew up, you know, in our mid twenties, like, well, what do we want to do? Like, is this it? Do we want to open a juice shop in Hawaii or, you know, go teach English in Thailand? I, one day, and I remember it like it was yesterday. I said to her, you know, you remember that one thing I did that float tank thing in that guy's house? And she said, yeah. And I said, why don't we open a float center? And she said, okay. And she never says, okay, <laughs> to really any, any of my harebrained ideas. And then from there, I just threw myself into the research, the origins of, of sensory deprivation, and then put together a bootstrapped plan to, to break away from my sort of corporate gig and open a wellness center. And at the time, there were 35 float centers in the country. There was a place in Chicago that had been open since like the 80s. There was a place in Manhattan. These were both like in-home float centers. This was like somebody lived and had a float tank in their basement. And they would let you come use it. And yeah, exactly. So you found this guy on Craigslist and you went to his house. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. This was like in 2010? This was in like, this was in like 2008. Wow. Yeah. I, I wanted it so bad, you know, yeah. was, I, <laughs> That's crazy. I like, you know, I, I knock on the door and he comes up and you know, he was a massage therapist and yoga instructor. Mm. So he's got like a top bun and he's like, Hey, thanks for coming. And I was like, thanks for having me. Yeah. You're not going to kill me. Right. Right. right, right. <laughs> he's like, I get that joke all the time. Yeah. You stinker. Come on in. And then like we went downstairs and he had this float tank set up in his basement and it was, it, it's the type of thing. And, and, and I, and I always go back to this. It's the type of, of, of practice that you can do that, that is sort of a peak experience. You know, Abraham Maslow talks about like peak experiences, transcendent experiences. Mm -hmm. This is something that's safe and reliable that is, you don't have to eat a bunch of weird drugs. You don't have to fast for a hundred days. You don't have to go be under a Bodhi tree in Tibet. Like you can go into a float tank and know yourself better. And so it was so important for me to have that experience that I was willing to go to Brian's basement. And <laughs> get is he still in business? Do you know? I think the last I checked, he's still there. Yeah. Uh, he, I don't know if he has float tanks anymore, but I see his uh, Facebook posts occasionally. Yeah. Interesting. And it's the same kind of unit you probably have where you're enclosed, you feel safe. And so once you're in there, you felt totally comfortable probably. But yeah. It was just, yeah. Wow, that's super interesting. So is it a way to kind of accelerate this feeling of being present and aware in our body? Is that kind of what it, it shortens that path a little bit? Is that kind of... Yeah. The, the, the acronym that the industry uses is REST, which is in Restricted Environmental Stimuli Therapy. So when you restrict environmental stimuli, so there's no sound, there's no taste, there's no... Um, touch because you're floating in a thousand pounds of Epsom salt water. And not only that, are you, are you, have you restricted your five senses, but also gravity. Mm. And what we don't think about is how uh, tied to the earth that we are. Gravity is a real thing. And our central nervous system is having to deal with that all the time. So when we don't have our five senses of input coming into our brain that makes us in a sympathetic state, then and gravity, what it does is it changes your sympathetic state into a parasympathetic state. So that means like rest, digestion, blood flow, these things that we just do involuntarily, mm -hmm. it kicks those things online. There's a cascade, there's a, there's a, there's a bunch of great research that we can, you know, I'm happy to share any, anything and everything that I know, but there is a, there is a physiological explanation for why this is good for you. And then there is a meditative um, um, sort of psychosomatic experience too of, of being isolated from the world by yourself. It's sort of, you know, the way that I joke about it is like the, the float tank kind of, the float tank kind of meditates you, mm -hmm. you know, it's like a meditation device. Super fascinating. So the sensory, the, the, the deprivation of that, right, of, of senses, I mean, just to kind of deviate slightly from the conversation, but it's related, I went on a hunting trip for eight days and food tasted so much better out there, but it was the same food that I've eaten here. And it was almost meditative eating it. And part of it was like the environment, the circumstances were rough. It was super cold. It was like the end of October in Idaho. So I was thinking about that. Like, why does food taste so good out here? So um, part, but, but part of that was like, there was not, I, I didn't have any screens. There was no EMF, Wi-Fi. Like 
th there was not a lot of other sensory things besides moving and seeing stuff. So would that be part of it? Because it kind of relates to what you were talking about, that REST acronym. Like when you kind of remove some of these inputs, if we're yeah. all unknowingly kind of being bombarded by, it seems that our, our, our sensory systems are almost on an overload standpoint. Totally. I mean, yeah. we, we, we cannot avoid um, media. We can't avoid EMFs. We can't avoid um, just sort of the, the, the environment that all of us live in, unless you're out in the woods. Mm -hmm. and, I mean, and there's, there's lots of good research that, you know, that got, talks about grounding and forest bathing and being in nature and, and grounding into the, the, the sort of frequencies of the planet. And when you're stripping things down, when you're reducing your input, when you're reducing your stimuli, yeah, you're going to maybe notice your breath a little bit more. You, you know, um, you're going to appreciate your company a little bit more. The food is going to taste a little bit better because you're simplifying, you know, you're, you're really hearkening back to earlier, earlier humanity, earlier human. Yeah. And so, yeah, like whatever, whatever you're doing is going to be that much more enriched because you're not buzzed around by push notifications and EMFs. Yeah. yeah so it was so fascinating to me. And I, w I was wondering physiologically why that was when I was out there. So, but yeah, the, the floating experience is pretty remarkable. Um, I, I had seen signs around and I wasn't quite sure like what it was all about until Stephen Kotler's book, uh, Stealing Fire came out. And I guess evidently, and correct me if I'm wrong, Navy SEALs and other, you know, like infantry uh, in, individuals, when they wanted to learn a foreign language very quickly, they would learn it in a float take because I guess it would accelerate some of the learning. So I used to listen to audiobooks at like 2x mm -hmm. and I could really, because you could really pay attention. And so the downside, like I, I got this little Bluetooth speaker and I would bring it to the Kirkland, you know, which is no longer business, their, their float center and um, listen to audiobooks, and it was amazing. Like, I can remember, mm. I can't remember what books exactly, like Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow, a few other books, but it was like, that's, that information really stuck. It was pretty interesting. So um, it seems like the military has been using this technology to, sh to circumvent learning. Is that... Yeah, that, that's actually the origin of the of, of sensory deprivation. It uh, th goes back to the inventor, the creator, John C. Lilly, who was commissioned uh, as part of the Navy to research what it, it was sort of, they were sort of associating it with um, like being in deep, in deep sea. And what they used to think was if you were, if you were cut off from sensory input, you would just like fall asleep. I mean, yeah. if you didn't, if you didn't, if you weren't processing things, environmental stimuli, you would just like <laughs> nod off. And the opposite is true. When you're in that state, um, your your brain waves change from alpha uh, to theta. So the the frequency of the theta brainwave state, which is a meditative state of consciousness, though you have longer durations of this theta brainwave state, and they're more frequent. And so the application for the origin of the sensory deprivation tank with John Lilly, yeah, has been expanded. Now there's there's float centers dedicated just to veteran populations um, for treating PTSD. Um, there's stories in the literature about people learning languages at like four X the speed of, of normal. There, one of my st old staff members, uh, learned Swedish in like six months. Like she was fluent in Swedish cause she would go into the float tank. She'd close the shop down and then just listen to like, I don't remember what it was. Maybe it was Rosetta Stone, but she was practicing her Swedish in the float tank and she got good quick. Wow. There's other research that applies to like, um, athletic performance, free throw shooting. And the way that they set that up was through visualization. So you go into the float tank and you visualize every shot, perfect backspin, swish every time. And they showed that the people that, that were in there visualizing that practice were actually better when they had to apply that uh, in real life. Mm. And so, I mean, we still know so little about how the brain works and mm. how we learn and what is consciousness. But we do know that when we're not distracted by really anything, like you learning books, remembering those times where you were able to really focus in, just imagine the applications for for PTSD, uh, for for language learning and sports performance. I mean, it's it, it can apply to anybody. That's that's remarkable. So those athletes that were visualizing, did they have a control group or they were having, say, the, the people still visualize, but they didn't do that in the float and take? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Wow, that's super fascinating. And there was another one with darts, uh, you know, because darts is like a highly focused, you know, uh, I mean, all sports is, but there was darts, free throw shooting, 
And then I think there was bo- maybe bowling was another one. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah. seems like archery. I mean, there could be a lot of applications for that. Wow. And, yeah. and so getting back to the, to the neurophysiology, if you will, you were saying that, that the brain waves are changed. So alpha, theta, maybe if we can, because like if someone's ever done breath work or gone to yoga, what are some of the, the characteristic or ascribed changes within brain waves? And are, are those similar parallels that you see when you do floating? Is it? Yeah. The, the connection, the connection is, um, so theta brainwave states are more, more frequent within meditation states. Mm. Um, the way that I like to describe it for people who have never either had that moment in a meditation where they're like, Oh my gosh, that's it. For people that have never experienced that or floating, you know, when you wake up first thing in the morning, uh, naturally without an alarm or a six year old or seven year old waking you up, um, that moment where you're awake, you know, you're awake, but you're not, you don't really hear anything. Your hearing hasn't come on yet. You haven't started to move. You haven't opened your eyes, but you know that you're awake. That snippet, which may last three seconds or 10 seconds or whatever, before you like, okay, I hear the crow outside your house. That, that sort of, you're not really awake and you're not really asleep is what the theta brainwave state feels like. And what we know from the brain research is the theta state is tightly correlated with our subconscious mind. Mm. You know, so the work of like Dr. Joe Dispenza and Bruce Lipton points to this theta brainwave state as like super intuitive learning. So in meditation, when you're having these deep, deep insights into yourself in a flotation tank where you have nowhere to go and nothing to do, you're not going to look at Twitter or talk to your friends or eat a cheeseburger. You're just there. You're just being, you're breathing. That that state, your, your, your brain knows what it wants to do in there and will shift from thinking about cheeseburgers to the relationship with your wife, to death, to this non thought, you know, which is the goal, not non thought, but, but, you know, sort of mindfulness is what happens naturally within the flotation tank. And so an hour float for some people feels like 10 minutes because they got into that state. And that theta brainwave state, the same way that when you're not really awake, not really asleep or, or meditating is punctuated by these feelings of time loss. Um, you don't know how long you've been in there, um, punctuated by feeling, you know, sort of Jungian connection with everything, um, um, you know, sort of global consciousness, this interconnectedness of things. And it happens, it's inside of us. It's part of us. And, and we, we, it's so hard for us to access those states of consciousness because we're so busy. Because a lot of people aren't versed at meditation or they don't take the time to do it and so forth. Yeah. Yeah. Now getting into the, the subconscious mind, I think that's pretty fascinating, especially now in January, right? Where a lot of people are making, they're making lofty goals for what they want to accomplish this year, whether it's weight loss, finances, relationships, whatever. Would this be a way to sort of more solidify the subconscious mind where maybe you could think about, you know, why people, we all know that we should eat better food and not binge watch Netflix and drink alcohol, right? But we still do it for whatever reason, or a lot of people do. Um, they know they shouldn't go to fast food restaurants, but they do. So how, so how could they potentially maybe use something like a float tank or getting into that high theta wave state, right? Yeah. How could they... What are some best practices? Like, what would you recommend? Like, listening to an audiobook while you're doing that, or thinking about your new self, like visualizing what your future self should be doing instead of like doing these same old patterns? Like, how yeah, can, you can do all those things. The, yeah. the way I like to think about it is that there's sort of two ways to float one is passive and one is active. So, if you are overly stressed, your adrenals are out of control, you're in, you have inflammation, you're unorganized mentally, you're stressed out and tired and everybody sucks and you want to go eat worms. Like you just need a break from everything. Um, just going into the flow tank, having a shower, getting into the tank, laying back, feeling what that feels like on your body, getting that, that deep sense of calm and just letting your mind go just to be just to capital B capital E for an hour has immense, immense benefits. Um, I mean, just innumerable benefits, including magnesium absorption, including traction on your spine because of the weightlessness. So that would be sort of like a passive, uh, passive float experience. 
what you're kind of talking about is more like an active float experience. So if you want to go in and go through a visualization practice, if you've got a, a test tomorrow and you want to kind of review some of the content from the test, perfect place to do it. If you have a job interview, if you are going to go on a first date, if you want to manifest in your life, if you want to bring things toward you, you have to go there mentally first. Like your YouTube channel, your products, your brand, you are fully intentional. You thought of all this stuff. It all came from inside your brain first. And the float tank is the perfect place to be undistracted and to go into those states of consciousness where you can actually decide what you want out of your life, what you want out of your future. Uh, you know, it's, uh, the Seahawks are in the playoffs. Uh, um, you know, we had a couple of running back injuries and they brought back two running backs this year, uh, Marshawn Lynch and Robert Turbin and Robert Turbin came in and floated, uh, on Saturday before the game. And when I met with him, uh, I said, hey, you know, you, you should do two things in here. One is breathe, and the other is, relax, is, is visualize tomorrow. And he's like, I visualize all the time. And I said, okay, do it in here. He's like, well, okay. So giving him a referential breath that he could go to when he got extracted, when he got distracted, I mean, you can imagine the pressure of coming oh my back. <laughs> like, so much. The, the, that, that, that level of performance needs an equal amount of recovery. Like when you're operating at that high of a level, you need a level of, perf of, of recovery and rest and recuperation that will match that level of performance. And for him, um, I gave him just basically one very simple breathing and visualization technique that afterward he came out, he goes, he goes, I cannot believe that I'm just hearing about this breath work now. He goes, I, my mind goes a thousand miles an hour. I'm visualizing scoring touchdowns every day. Like this is my life. Football is my life. It was so much easier for me to get focused on my visualization by having this breath work. And so the application, if you're trying to be a better person, if you're trying to live a more healthier life, if you have intentions and goals, go into a float tank in a structured, organized way and repeat some affirmations to yourself. I am whole, perfect, strong, powerful, harmonious, loving, and happy. You do that for an hour, just repeat that mantra over and over and over. That's actually taken from a, the master key system, which is something that I just am super hot on right now. But just going into a mantra, that self-affirmation, you know, we have the power to heal ourselves. We just don't know how to do it. Or we have self-critical thoughts and we say negative self-talk. So it seems that, and I'm, I'm just, as you're explaining this, I'm inferring from that, that maybe that self-critical, well, yeah, maybe, you know, you can't do this. You're not good enough. You've always been poor. You've always been fat. Maybe it seems like that's kind of diminished or attenuated a little bit by this sensory deprivation. Is that kind of what, what we're... Yeah. Wow. Well, and we were talking before we turned the mics on about the default mode network. Mm -hmm. And there is a lot of research on uh, coming out of the Laureate Institute of Brain Research in Tulsa, Oklahoma. That's the acronym is LIBR, LIBER. What LIBER is looking at is the effect on the default mode network. And the default mode network, the way that I like to think about it, is it's, it's sort of our um, ego, it's, it's when, when no one else is around and you're not doing anything else, where does your mind go? And for some of us, our minds go into, you're so stupid. You're so lazy. Why can't you f find someone to love? Why can't you make more money? It's really like diminished, right? That's, a, that's a, that's an expression of, of, of an unhealthy relationship with the self that lives in the default mode network. Some of us are much more intentional when the lights are out and it's quiet and your self-talk comes online, that default mode of thinking that's an actual network inside of the brain, um, trying to figure what else connects to that. Probably the amygdala maybe, or I, I don't know, I'm just guessing. I'm trying, there's like a, there's like a, um, it might actually go into the HPA axis, mm. the hippocampus, pituitary and adrenal systems that, that, helps quiet that, that helps quiet that mode, helps quiet that ego, that qu whether it's, um, whether you're an egotist maniac or you're a self-loathing keel, like 
it equalizes that default mode network so that you can just be, you can actually reach levels of consciousness that are, that are balanced and present. And that, I mean, that in and of itself is something that is so needed. We all need to do that more often. Oh, hundred yeah. percent. That's really amazing. That's cool that, I mean, athletes are, are seeking you out and you get to have conversations with these people. And I always assume that if you're getting paid maybe $500,000 a game or whatever, that you would have access to every, the latest gadget and gadget. I mean, everyone would, but, but they're seemingly, these guys are eating junk food and stuff. And, you know, uh, Rashad Penny, who unfortunately got hurt, which is why Robert Turbin is in, was saying he used to eat McDonald's and then he finally got off McDonald's. And then now the, getting back to the Seahawks, I mean, he was, he had some amazing breakout games. So it's like, how could someone that's getting paid six, seven figures a game one afternoon is eating food like that and doesn't have access to these things. So it's pretty amazing. So it just brings us back to, and that's why we have these podcasts and these conversations because we all need to sort of hear these things. Um, so what would be, and I want to talk more about alpha waves and, and yeah. psychedelics. We're going to get into all that, but let's say someone's listening and they're like, all right, I want to make sure this year really is my best year ever. Okay. How many days a week would in an ideal world, considering finances and eating healthy food and all this sort of stuff, like what would be kind of the minimum effective dose of sensory deprivation to help to really make make that self talk stick? Yeah, great question. the The science there's there was a study conducted in Sweden. This was specifically about workplace burnout. Hmm. And when I say workplace burnout, there are thousands of people going, "Yep, me, I'm that's there. me." Workplace burnout for sure. There was a study conducted out of out of Sweden that looked at what that minimum effective dose was, and it used a control group. And the way that they found was the most effective with the least amount of application was nine floats in 27 days. So that's a float, a day off, a float, a day off, a float, three days off, and then the same rhythm twice more. Mm. So it equals to nine floats in 27 days. And so there's packages that we offer uh, that Float Seattle offers that sort of cater to that because that's sort of the baseline. Now, that said, if you are ready for a massive change in your life, if it's like, this is my decade, I am going to go for this. I have a lot of goals. I've got a lot of strong intentions. I feel really motivated for change. What I would suggest is that you go float like three or four times in a week because what that will do is it will get you in touch with yourself it will reduce your cortisol levels because that's what the studies show it does anyway. It lowers your cortisol. It lowers your epinephrine and your adrenaline and increases your serotonin. And so by hitting it hard up front, you're actually resetting some of some of the like deleterious brainwave effects that you just deal with every day and often deal with with four glasses of wine and six hours of Netflix, right? Mm-hmm. Like we all we all have the same we all have the same things that that we have to deal with. So what I would suggest is if you are ready, if you are really primed and ready to make a major, major change this year, I would suggest that you go float like six times in two weeks and really get into a groove. At the end of that two weeks, you're going to be different. You're going to think differently. You're, you're for sure going to be more relaxed. You're absolutely undeniably going to have more magnesium in your body, which fuels mitochondria, which lubricates the synomial fluid in our joints, helps with digestion. And because you absorb it through your skin, it's more bioavailable than, than consumed. You still should take a magnesium supplement mm-hmm. orally, but this is a, this, and it's magnesium sulfate. So it's not three and eight and glycinate and the other magnesiums, but yeah, if you're committed, you should hit it hard up front to just like reset, like tabula rasa, just clear everything out, just go back to baselines and then operate from there. Well, you said baseline and, and that's interesting, right? Because most people's baseline is elevated, right? Like I noticed like when I came back from, not to talk all about this hunting trip, but like my baseline was reduced, like my level of stress, things. And then I, I got back into this rut. Like we fall into this, I used to race motorcycles and you would always try to avoid the ruts because you would get stuck in them. And we all have this rut that we get into and you notice it like when you transition from a vacation back to home, you're like, I can feel that stress again. Like I'm, in, I'm always on edge or whatever. And so I think what I heard you say is like, maybe we can take that thermostat for this default mode network and kind of dimmer it down so that we reduce our baseline a little bit. So totally. And our way of thinking. And, and, and I didn't want to interrupt you there, but I think it's really interesting. Like I used to be really nervous about public speaking and, uh, and I found that if I have these safe places, so if I do get nervous, if I get up there and I'm like, 
I think, oh my gosh, I'm going to forget what I'm going to say or whatever. I just have this safe place where I can go and I know that everything's going to be okay. Everything passes, right? Like I wiggle my toes, right? I do this or that. And it, so it doesn't happen to me anymore. And so I think that if people have like this thing, maybe they, they drive by McDonald's and they think I'm going to have a weak moment. Like, cause I, I hit McDonald's, I hit fast food. I go to 7-Eleven every day after work. How am I going to break that habit? If you could maybe visualize yourself in the float tank, passing by McDonald's, by not having a glass of wine, whatever, then it would like really kind of make that rut maybe go away. And so I think that can be super helpful because totally. a lot of people want fat burning supplements. A lot of people want exogenous ketones. These things have their roles, right? But if you can really, I'm all about like root cause resolution, like get at the problem. Yeah. So I think it's fascinating. Yeah. I mean, even most, most folks don't have a reference point for that level of relaxation. I mean, you, it, it is, it is so unique that feeling when you're inside a float tank where it's quiet and warm and you're weightless and you're naked and you're breathing and everything is okay. Most people have never experienced that level of, of lowering their stress and adrenaline to a, to that baseline. And so, yeah, I've said in the past, just like that same example, yeah. like when, when you're beginning to redline, when you're beginning to just like knee jerk, buy a cheeseburger or knee jerk, you know, drinking a bunch of, drinking a bunch of alcohol. If you can picture and have a reference point for that re level of relaxation, you know, your, your subconscious mind remembers that they know your, your brain knows what that feels like. Mm -hmm. And if you can just close your eyes, hopefully not while you're driving, just close your eyes for a quick second and just like put yourself back into the float tank for a second and feel what that feels like. You can think more clearly. You can make better decisions for yourself. You can be actually a better person. So I, I absolutely. Yeah. Because it, it gets easier. I think going both ways. Like if you're get, I used to get really irritated in the car, like traffic in Seattle, you know, you grew up around here. Like it can be, and especially drivers, like they don't, they're at a green light and they're just sitting there. I used to get really upset, honk the horn in this. And so that was my, that was my rut. I would naturally get, so it was so easy to get irritated. And then once I started learning meditation through the insight meditation society, the Vipassana technique, then like I, I moved that baseline down. Right. So I think it's, yeah, I mean, for a lot of people, like you said, I mean, the way that they get into that calm state is through substances, right? Which is not really sustainable. I mean, yeah, that's, that's one way to do it, but it's like, are you really going to have five glasses of wine before that work presentation or before you lead that webinar? Probably not. It's probably going to compromise your performance. So if you could figure out a more natural, sustainable way to, to really attenuate that anxiety. Yeah. yeah I mean, cool. it starts with, I mean, for me and, and my coaching clients and you yourself too, like Vipassana starts with breath. Like it's the closest thing. It's the most accessible thing for you. So on your way and your commute home, instead of turning right to go into a fast food place, you can first and foremost, just breathe, like take whether, whether you want to do a box breath or, or a four, seven, eight breath. Like there's lots of different ways to, to just bring yourself back down when you're in that, that crux moment, like I'm about to make a bad decision. Am I going to do it or am I not going to do it? Mm. No. We need that reminder constantly. Yeah. It's funny. I mean, anytime you find yourself uptight, and you remember to breathe, you're like, oh, I have control in this situation. It's super fascinating. Yeah. And a lot of people, have you dove into the uh, cholinergic anti-inflammatory reflex axis? It's kind of a complex system, but a lot of people don't realize that, that they're inflamed. So they're stressed and they don't realize why they're inflamed. And so there's this intricate kind of network with our stress response and our, our, this anti-inflammatory reflex arc that's connected to your spleen. It has to do with Chinese medicine and all this, but it's, it's really kind of characterized through Western allopathic medicine, but just breathing stimulates that vagal nerve and, and kind of creates an anti-inflammatory interleukin 10 cytokine throughout the body. So it's really kind of fascinating that mm. breath is not like just this woo woo thing that it used to be. Like we have a lot of Western science now that is kind of characterizing how the neuropharmacology and the physiology and the endocrine response to breath work, which I think is really fascinating. And in Herbert Benson's book, I mean, he talked about this, I think in 2007. So, um, you mentioned like box breathing and, mm -hmm. and all that. A lot of people are, are buying, you know, Wim Hof's course and, and this, there's a lot of, what do you recommend like for resources, um, for breath work for people? Yeah. Wim, I, I love the Wim Hof method. Um, I did it for a while and I, and in fact, in, did that in tandem with the float tank for a minute. And there were some other, um, 
customers that were actually experimenting with it too, you know, biohacker types that were down to experiment, you know, even getting out of the float tank and taking a cold shower and then getting back in. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I, I like, um, um, there's a guy named Niraj Nayak. Um, he runs the Soma Breathwork Institute and mm. it's in Bali and he, he has been Wim Hof's right hand man for a long time. He's got a lot of different like variable breaths, but I think in my opinion, I think that w- we all have different tastes and flavors and propensities for breaths. You know, like we, one breath might work really well for you and not for me. And maybe it's physiological, maybe it's the size of my lungs, or maybe it's the, just my, my mentality. But I think that you have to experiment with lots of different types and whether it takes, you know, in a box breath, it's, it'll take 16 seconds to get through one set. You know, if, if you practice doing a box breath and you do three sets, three times a day, you're going to feel different. Like mm-hmm. it will be noticeable if you start, if you, if you don't have any other experience breathing with any specific structured way, you know, uh, I've been, I've been really liking the four, seven, eight breath. Uh, it's an Andrew Weil. So it's, it's four seconds in it's seven seconds hold and then a forcible exhale for eight. And you do, I think you do two sets of that and you do it twice a day in the morning, in the evening time. And what it does, it sort of like clears out the filaments of your lungs. It's like, it's like this exhale is like, I was wondering, yeah, eight seconds, but forcible. So you're constricting your lips so that you're providing pressure. Right. And it helps get like the lower lobes of the lung. It clears out. It clears out the stuff that's in your lungs. Interesting. Yeah. I don't remember what podcast I was listening to, but I heard Andrew Weil talk about it mm. and started to work with it doing in the morning and the evening time. And it's really relaxing and it takes no time at all. But yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think I think for a lot of people, Wim Hof is accessible and some of the things that he doing just defy science. I mean, injecting yourself with toxins mm-hmm. and just breathing through it is pretty amazing. It's amazing. Yeah. I mean, that was a well-controlled study too. Right. I mean, I've read that cover to cover a couple of times and I was like, this is incredible. I mean, they just randomized people to these two different groups and it was like only 10 weeks of training. That That's fascinating. Yeah. It's really cool. Um, I, I just love these free tools that we have because the barrier to entry to some of these things gets expensive, right? I mean, juve lights, float tanks and this, and we all have to breathe regardless, right? And so things like fasting, things like exercise, breath work, and I think it has a lot of carryover to many different applications. So, um, yeah, I, I, I try to work on it with my kid all the time because she gets frustrated and she'll want to throw things or break a crane or whatever. And it's like, Nez, we got to do our 10 breaths. She's like, oh, yeah. And, yeah. and so, you know, we weren't taught this stuff. Maybe yeah. you were. You, you said you learned TM early. Yeah. Yeah. I, my folks, my folks taught me TM very early and I hated it. I mean, I hated it. Like, what are we doing? What is the the last thing on earth I want to do when I'm, when I have a lot of energy is sit quietly and breathe and, you know, put my eyes up at an angle and repeat my mantra. Like I do not have any interest in that. I'm 12 years old. My hormones are raging. All I want to do is just go like tackle my friend outside. Right. Like that's, but that that introduction, the same way that you're introducing your daughter to breath work, the fact that this is accessible to us, you know, and I do the same thing, and we have we have sort of a relaxation technique of that's that's sort of like EFT, it's sort of like tapping, hmm. but it's like touching it with your body, and and tapping with your hand uh, on your limbs up towards your heart, just to like link the the body with the breath, but. It's, it, it's, it's the most accessible, lowest hanging fruit for you, be able to, for you to be able to regulate yourself. And it's going to be increasingly important for our children to do that. There is going to be more pressure. Things are going to move quicker. There's going to be more information and push notifications and automation. Like it's a superpower. I mean, we learned it later and my meditation practice in the, in, the, in, in, in my childhood went through all sorts of peaks and valleys and different changes and frustrations and stuff like that. But having, having some awareness of the fact that we can regulate ourselves with our breath, it is, a, it is a superpower. It is the, it is the first thing that you should do if you want to get better. hundred percent. What's frustrating about someone that's a new meditator is they don't talk about some, like, like we, we talk about silos in traditional medicine, like the, you know, the, the endocrinologist doesn't speak to the, to the, you know, you name the specialty, right? Gastroenterologist. But when I went through Vipassana technique and it was great and all that, but like, I, and not that I want to be careful here because like linking 
achievement to some sort of meditative state. Like I like to get into that calm state, but then I've heard Dan Harris and other people say, well, that's not the goal. The goal is just to be that moment to moment awareness. Right. But anyhow, you know, for someone like yourself, like you described, you know, when you were 12 and you just want to run outside, if you could do some rest beforehand and then meditate, it's so much more enjoyable and better. And you feel like you can actually, you know, be more present. Right. And so I I feel like we have different silos in the so-called integrative medicine space, right. Where it's like, The left hand sometimes doesn't talk to the right hand. So integrating all these techniques, it can be seemingly like there's so much to learn, right? But once you take the pieces that work for you, like you just said, like if box breathing is, it gets you there faster, then great. And so that's what I do now is like a retention breath before I do my meditation. Ah. It's like, now I can make this a habit. Before it was like, how am I ever going to make this a habit, right? Because it was just so hard. So I'd rely upon things like the muse and heart math and, and feedback. But if I can do my breath work beforehand, meditation is like so easy. It's like, I can sit there for 15, 20 minutes and not be like constantly thinking, when is this over? When is this over? Right. Yeah. So it's just fun to, so to, what, so tell me about the breath that you actually do before you sit down. Yeah. So a uh, buddy of mine, Josh Trent, who's been on the podcast before, mm-hmm. uh, wellness force radio is his podcast. He's a great individual. So he just taught me this. It was just a Wim Hof retention technique. So it's just 30. It's basically hyperventilation, hold, and then repeat. And so you do, it's some form of hyperventilation retention. And so you do, um, I usually do about 30 now. I can work up to 30 really rapid breaths, trying to hyperventilate and then just retention and hold and really focus on just pressing in that diaphragm and holding there to the point that it's uncomfortable and then going another seven seconds, then taking like eight box breaths after that and then repeating. So I do that twice a day ah. and man, it's really been a game changer. And then, so. so you do that. So it's like, okay, it's time to meditate. Do you go and sit and get into the breath? And then after, as soon as that breath cycle is done, then you sit and then do you breathe again afterward or is after the meditation you're set? I'm done. Yeah. yeah I'll just use the insight meditation timer yeah. app. I like it. It has an element of social proof and you can track and everything like that. Um, but that's, yeah, that's been my routine and I would go in and out of that routine for a long time and like stick with it for 10 days, two weeks, and then like I'd miss a week. And I was like, what is wrong with me? Why can't I do this? Like I have the best of intentions, but it was because I wasn't, I don't want to say breath work circumvented anything, but it just helped me get calm beforehand and enabled me, my brain to just be like, okay, I'm present. I'm here now. I'm, I'm good. And so it's been just, yeah, maybe I'm, Maybe I messed up. I don't know. But it's like, I, I think other people, like I'm trying to think like if I could get my dad to meditate, like how yeah. could I convince him to do that? Getting into the, doing the breath work beforehand. Totally. You know, it's like, it's always easier to meditate after yoga because you're already there. Right. You know, you're already, you're already there. So it's like, but I don't want to, who has time to do an hour of yoga and then meditate after, right? right? Like a lot of people are trying, they have 20 minutes to allocate towards these things. Right. Anyway. So it's just cool to. Like, like you just said, like you got to figure out what works for you yeah. and constantly experiment, you know? Yeah. You gotta, you gotta test it and, you know, tracking, making a list of 10 different breaths that you want to try just, I mean, it, it takes a, just a little bit of intention and tracking to, to experiment with the thing that works. One of them will stick. One of them will make you feel really good. Mm-hmm. One of them will help you relax. And then it's just, um, sticking with it. Yeah. That, that creating a habit takes a little time. Right. Yeah. I found if I go outside, it's better too, because I'm breathing fresh air, I'm outside, I'm, I keep my eyes open during it. But anyway, so just giving people insights and, and reminders and so forth. But, um, you know, sort of getting back to to some of the things that, that we were talking about earlier, the, the default mode network and integrating all that. Um, there's also neurofeedback and people are doing neurofeedback and, and there's this device here, the V-Lite. Um, evidently, these, Sean, these probes and, and people watching the video can see this how these uh, LED lights, how they're situated is to intentionally affect the default mode network. The uh, Lou Lim, who founded this company, that's what, so they've done some interesting research on different disease states like Alzheimer's and post-concussive syndrome and PTSD, which is Mm -hmm. similar to to what you're talking about. Um, But neurofeedback, you've been experimenting with that recently and and you've had some great results. You want to talk about that? Yeah, yeah. So um, I had uh, Ciara Good, who is the um, owner operator of Seattle Neurofeedback, reached out to me. Um, she was a podcast listener of my the, the Optimal Performance podcast, and she said, "You know, hey, um, I, you haven't done a neurofeedback episode yet. You know, you should come try it. You should check it out." And and I think for guys like guys and gals like us who are who are tracking, you know. 
you're maybe a maybe full canary and you're sensitive to like you know something that's a little bit off but you're at least really aware of like how you feel you know like you know when you're inflamed you know either through quantification or through just sort of an intuitive sense of where your body is um so going into neurofeedback i didn't have massive expectations i also wasn't having to treat a traumatic brain injury or insomnia or a uh, autoimmune disease like a lot of people do that that turn to neurofeedback but what neurofeedback does, the, the, the part of the most fascinating aspect of neurofeedback is how simple it is to do a session. So you go into the office, you know, the intakes, the intake um, session is, okay, what do you want to improve? She's asking questions about um, um, your birth because that sort of trauma from childbirth is actually stored in, in our body and in our brains. Mm. Um, so if you had a really traumatic birth or if your you know, mother was a smoker or a drinker, like that affects you. Um, and so you do this intake form, like, oh, I want to quit smoking or I want to quit eating fast food. I want to, I've got a Jimmy leg or I've got, um, you know, um, uh, some sort of trauma that I want to confront. And it, after that process, uh, you start and, and it's you you put a, a similarly looking headset on your head 19 points of connection on, on the um, uh, on the brain actually the that's the wavi which is a, a brain mapping um, the neurofeedback device is it just has you know sensors on your head and then you watch TV and as you're watching TV the the machine is tracking your brain waves and as you're watching television, your brain knows you're watching TV, duh, but your brain also sees itself as the screen begins to flicker. Mm. So as you're, uh, what did I watch? Uh, I, the first couple of, <laughs> the first couple of neurofeedback sessions, I was watching Peaky Blinders, mm. which is this like old school gangster, like British gangster show, a lot of violence. And I was like, does it matter that I'm watching something that's violent and intense? She's like, just watch something that you like. I'm like, okay. So as I'm watching this with the sensors on my head, the, the, the screen is flickering. It's getting smaller and then getting bigger. The sound is getting quieter and then louder. And you're also adding the sensory element and holding this bear, this teddy bear that vibrates. Mm. So as your brain is going through its doing what brain does, it's seeing that the that it's making the screen go dim and light. It's it's making the volume go up and down. The brain knows that that's what it's looking at the same way that it does in like really expensive uh, brain technology that they have at like um, um, at hospitals uh, and brain centers. And then as it's doing that, it's actually cor it's actually correcting itself. And so what they can do is they can adjust the tracking so that they can adjust the hertz up or down for different effects. And so I have to date done 16 neurofeedback sessions. Mm. And after the first two were sort of like, eh, I feel relaxed. I feel good. Uh, similar to like what I would feel like after a meditation session. The third session that I had, she was tinkering around with the controls a little bit. And at the end of the session, I felt like I needed to sleep. Like I was wiped out. I was really, really super tired. And I was like, I don't know what you did, but I am wiped out. And she's like, okay, well, I was, I was, um, I was, I was trying something. Uh, here's a glass of water. You may want to get, go get something to eat before you jump in the car and go home. And so throughout this process, there's these adjustments that are made to the technology that your brain is watching on the screen and making adjustments to itself. And my goals was, I, I, what I found was that I was thinking more longitudinally than I had in a long time. I was thinking into the future about my business. I was thinking into the future about my family in a way that I hadn't been able to do for a while. And suddenly, all of these cool creative ideas came through. Mm. Suddenly, I had the idea for an online course. Suddenly, I like got my finances, my personal finances in order because I was thinking longer term. And as I was talking with her, I was like, you know, I don't know if this is a, if this is a result that you see it a lot or not. And she's like, that's not that common. I've heard of it before, but I think it's because you've spent 600 hours in a float tank, Sean. I mm. think it's because you, you know, eat keto. I think it's probably because you meditate. These are factors make your brain pretty happy 
pretty high functioning. And then um, we're tweaking these little tiny things. And what it did, it just sort of opened up my perspective. So what a couple of cool stories that she shared with me with neurofeedback is she heard from a colleague of hers that a teenage boy with like 80% of his body was covered in eczema. Eczema is tied to a lot of, can be tied to a lot of different things, the gut, autoimmune issues. After one session of neurofeedback, it went from 80% across his body to like 15%. Wow. Like his eczema literally like diminished in like three days. He went back, did another session and it was gone. So he kept with it, kept going, kept going. And there, there's another example. So it, it also helps for insomnia. <clears throat> They're using it really a, a lot for post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, and the way that we talk about it is like this idea of resilience, right? Like we were born with a bucket of resilience when we're born. And if our moms were smokers or drinkers, we have a little bit less. If we experienced trauma in our childhood, we have a little bit less resilience. And so what she was talking about in terms of the patients that she works with uh, who are dealing with PTSD is that for some people who fight side by side on the battlefield, experience massive atrocities, see themselves doing things that they never thought that they would, one, one soldier can come back and be fine. Another soldier who has way less resilience, way less resiliency because of X, Y, Z factors earlier in their life, they have almost zero. So when they come back, those experiences really, really mess with them. And so what neurofeedback can do is it can, it can fill your bucket back up with resiliency through your brain, knowing what it wants to do and correcting mistakes and, and sinking itself in a way that like makes you whole again. Hemispheric integration, which is also happens in a float tank. Your the hemispheres of your brain talk to each other and communicate more effectively. So for me, it was, it was a, it, it was a it was a it was a way to like even up level even more than all of the other wacky things that I do and nootropics and psychedelics and meditation all these things that I love what this was was it was it was helping me see my life in a in a longer term way which I think I think a lot of us could probably that's amazing that. yeah so you were able to further manifest and kind of make these thoughts and intentions more cohesive and sticky a little bit. Yeah. I, it, it's amazing. I saw the path where I have these goals and I've had them for a while, you know, um, and I didn't see the route. I didn't see the path toward it. And after, after some neurofeedback, um, I also had the honor of, of being a part of uh, Stephen Kotler's uh, Zero to Dangerous, which mm. is a flow uh, cultivation course, um, to, to find your ways into flow states. So I was doing that also, uh, I actually did that beforehand, but I didn't have the vision. I had the discipline to do my work, but I didn't have the vision for what my goals would be and how to get there. Um, and it opened me up and helped me focus in a huge way. That's cool. Yeah. Do you know Jan Venter? He's yeah. in British Columbia, uh, Vancouver. Yeah. He's been on the podcast, a friend of mine, but he's really into Stephen Kotler's work and he was creating this flow dojo in Vancouver, BC. I don't know the status of where it's at, but, uh, Wow, that's really fascinating. Um, so I did neurofeedback back in 2011, like six sessions. And I found it very frustrating because it was back then it was 24. It was a TV. It was the movie that I was watching. Uh. And it kept stopping, like you were saying. That, and I was like, dude, I'm never going to get this, man. This was before I learned how to meditate and everything like that. So I think now I'd be much more inclined and probably would maybe get a little bit of a better better outcome. You know, I wasn't eating keto back then. I mean, I was still kind of paleo grain free, but was... I was in my late twenties and, and, uh, you know, having wine at night and not sleeping that well and all that. So it'd be interesting. I would like to go back and just kind of you see You were it. early on the neurofeedback. Yeah. It was a buddy of mine, Fred Grover, uh, and he had a, an assistant in his office, Lori. And so he had, I can't remember what machine he had, but he worked with a lot of the Denver Broncos at that time ah. who had post concussive syndrome and, and early, you know, CTE. And so he found that that was really effective for their impulsivity. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, in Denver, I think they still do it quite a bit, but I don't, there was a few different machines and I was considering maybe getting one. There it was only like, let's say only, but it was $900. And I thought, because the session was, it got expensive yeah. pretty quick. And anyhow, so that's, it's, uh, it's cool. We have all these tools and technologies and what I like about them and what I've heard from Fred is these things are sticky. Like they, you do a few sessions and it can transform your brain, you know, and you don't need to maybe always do it as, as often, right? Maybe you do, like you said, 16, you do 20, 
and maybe do it once a month or once a quarter or whatever, just yeah. to, to sharpen the saw. Yeah. So I, I think the technology that, that is available to us is, it's just a matter of deciding what you want. What do you want? Do you want to be able to think more clearly? Do you want to reduce your stress? There's all of these techniques that we have, all of this tech, all of this wisdom that we can access. And, and yeah, it, it's expensive. A lot of it is. I mean, if, if, if you want to float every single day, you can do it, but you're going to pay, you know, you're going to pay a couple hundred bucks a month. Mm. You will be a different person. You will be vastly improved, but it is an investment. And the way that I think about it is how much is your life worth? How much is your quality of life worth? If you are just a walking ball of stress 24 seven and you're lousy to the people around you and maybe you're hashtag crushing it at work, but you're miserable and you can't sleep and you got an ulcer, it's probably worth taking a little bit of time to research how different modalities that will help you improve. And, and you never know which thing is going to just like totally change your life. Yeah. I, I think a lot of people, what I'm noticing is a lot of people have like a subclinical brain disorder. And, and I say that through, I don't want to be uh, cautious about how, how I frame this, but I, but I see a lot of like forgetfulness out there and people are really seemingly distracted and could really benefit from this. Like, like I'll meet people at conferences that I, that I met maybe once in like 2007 and I can remember their face, maybe not their name, but say, Hey, how you doing? You were, you live in, you know, whatever, Philadelphia. They're like, wow, how, how do you know that? I'm not saying I'm, I'm not this highly intelligent person, but they have no recollection of ever even coming in contact huh. with me. Right. So I, I see, and that's just like one example. We get customer service, people lose their emails all the time and passwords. And, and I just see a lot of this same thing. And I feel like is it diet related? Is it early onset mild cognitive impairments? Mm. Is it, what is it? Are those hemispheres like you're talking about not communicating? Cause I, I I'm seeing a lot of this and yeah. So I think that these strategies are, are super helpful. Um, one thing we haven't really dove into, but you've kind of, you know, tacitly kind of talked about is psychedelics. Yeah. Um, something that, that I feel like if we were to talk about psychedelics five years ago, people would just like stop listening. But now yeah. there's a lot of interest. I did a video just saying like, cause I, I did ayahuasca a few years ago and then microdose LSD and mushrooms used to grow mushrooms. I haven't done anything for like six or eight months, just took a little break, but, um, this is a passion of yours and, and maybe what experiences have you noticed? And then what, who are psychedelics for? Like who can benefit? Yeah. Well, I'll say a sort of like give the disclaimer, like we always should do is like, I'm not advocating necessarily for this. I'm not saying you should go out and try these. Like this is just my experience, but, um, the, one of the best things about the float tank is that it can get you into an altered state of consciousness. And that's something that cavemen did. I mean, that's something that, you know, lions are climbing up trees and eating fermented fruit and wowing out in the grass. You know, elephants are eating weird seeds and, and having these altered states. And that goes back to Stephen Kotler's work. Like we seek altered states of consciousness we're, we're, we're novel forms of consciousness in the way that we see the world. Like this is your seven year old spinning around on a tire swing to get dizzy and go, yeah. Whoa, dad, more and more. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Like I was that kid too. Yeah. It felt good. It felt weird. It felt funny. Like the, the, my perception of reality changed. Even hanging upside down was a trippy thing and, and still is for, for little kids. And so we, we, our, our bodies and our brains, we, we seek out these altered states of consciousness, whether they're in the forms of meditation or caffeine or, or, or float tanks or whatever. It's, I, I believe that they're really important for us because if we don't do them, then we forget about the importance of consciousness. We're more aware of what our brains can do. We're more aware of how we see the world and how we see ourselves and our places in the world when we step out of our normal, again, default mode network. Whoop, got a good work got to pay the bills, got to, you know, wag my finger and get mad at the guy in traffic. Like we just go through the motions. So my experience, um, my experience with psychedelics kind of go back into college and, um, started with, a you know, um, an LSD trip at a festival. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, it was, it was a, it was like a 10 hour ordeal where I felt closer to my friends than I had ever felt before. I felt love everywhere. I got to see, um, um, you know, the sort of matrix and matrices of the bark on trees in a way that I had never seen. Seeing a sunrise on, on LSD is, I mean, a, a, an incredible thing. Um, 
now it is bona fide. I mean, the the work of Rick Doblin at MAPS, which is the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, who has been an advocate for psychedelic research for decades, finally people are coming around. They're understanding that, well, perhaps um, psilocybin cubenzies, mushrooms, can help someone deal with the stress of the end of their life. This person just found out that they're going to die. And they, do, they are scared. They are petrified. They don't know what to do. A moderate dose of psilocybin mushrooms might actually help them die with more grace and more peace of mind. Like that is a profound application mm-hmm. of, of a simple little fungi, right? You know, the, the microdosing protocols that have been sort of, in, in our world, we're really, we're really aware of it. I don't know that many people are, but in the tech world, in Seattle, in San Francisco, people are microdosing LSD and mushrooms to not only see problems from a new perspective, but also focus in a new way. So not only see the bigger picture, the macro, but also activate on the micro to affect the bigger picture. So... Now, you know, they're decriminalized in Denver now. Um, Oregon, I think, is tre- trending that direction. Right. Yeah. Right. Like, it, now we know what it does. You know, depression is the number one mental illness on the planet. It is, it cripples people. It, it is, it is, and if you've ever, if you've ever experienced depression or if you've ever known someone who is depressed, it is, it is the most helpless feeling because you don't know what to do. And you and if it's someone that you know, you don't know how to help them. Mm. You can't tell them to cheer up. That's the worst thing you can do. So what now we're finding that applications of psilocybin mushrooms monitored in a way, applied in a strategic way, can actually help lift that cloud a little bit. Um, the, the research is showing that it also works for anxiety. And the way that I think about depression and anxiety, of course, is and and th- there this is beautiful because there is a direct parallel, I believe, with flotation therapy, with float tanks, and with meditation. When you think when you're depressed, you're thinking about the past. Why am I like this? Why is this going on? Why 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 why? What's happened in the past that's screwing with me? Man, I feel depressed about that. When you're anxious, you're worrying about the future. Mm-hmm. What's to come? What do I have to look out what look out for? Am I going to make? Am I going to pay, pay my bills this week? What that does is it keeps us out of the present moment. We are no longer we are no longer present in this moment. In this, you know, you and I are in flow states right now, having a really awesome conversation. Like we're in this present moment. What what psychedelics, meditation, um, flotation therapy do is it allows us to become more present in the moment. And so now that we know that that mushrooms may help people with depression and may help people with anxiety and PTSD and the fact that they're going to die in soon is a profound technology that you know if you not to go too far over the deep end but if you think about like the stoned ape theory from Terence McKenna that said like the reason that we developed language so quickly at this pivotal moment is because uh, cavemen were walking around eating mushrooms out of cow dung on the African savanna. So then suddenly they become better hunters. Suddenly they are able to um, grow their their um, their verbal abilities. And so, both personally in my experience and people that I've that I've talked to, sort of in this arena, and I've gone to trainings um, through Maps. There's a thing called the Zendo Project, mm. which helps to uh, reduce psychedelic harm. So if you're sitting with someone and they're having a quote unquote bad trip, what do you do? Right. Mm. So this is like for Burning Man specific, especially. Right. And they have camps set up where if people are really having a hard time, they can go. So I went through a training and we talked a lot about sort of these effects. And um, um, when you are when you're having that moment um, where you are no longer thinking the way that you normally do. When you don't see the world the way that you normally see it, you see another layer. You see through sort of the BS of culture. Culture is such an oppressive thing. I mean, we we it's why people, you know, shoot each other over chicken sandwiches. I mean, culture is is it's it's tricky. And so when we can transcend that even for a moment, for an hour, for two hours, for three hours with a clinical technician um, or with a clinician um, meditating in a flow tank, we are outside of all of this stuff that doesn't matter at all. 
and you can see yourself in a brand new way. And maybe that lifts your depression. Maybe that eases your anxiety. Maybe that brings you closer to yourself. Maybe that makes you a better dad. You want to go home and hug your family. You know, you don't want that glass of wine at night anymore. You don't want that cheeseburger anymore. You want to eat clean because you, you know yourself in a brand new way. So for me, you know, the shaman have known it for thousands and thousands of years that this is, this is an important and, and, and useful technology to help people transcend themselves and live better lives. And we're just now catching up to it. Right. It's amazing. Well, I mean, even, you know, Steve Jobs talked a lot about, you know, mushrooms and and psychedelics and tripping on acid and, and all that. So I think, but yeah, it, it takes culture. Like you talked about culture, like it takes us a long time to kind of rethink how we, you know, because growing up, we heard drugs are bad, dare, you know, all this sort of thing. But um, yeah, I, I think the biggest hurdle for some people is like, I, I know a lot of people want to get into this, but they're like, who do I buy acid from? Who do I buy <laughs> mushrooms from? Right. So my, my, my recommendations is, is get a book and learn how to forage mushrooms and, and yeah. you know, watch YouTube videos and things like that. There's a lot of good videos out there. Um, seek out new friends that, that may be able to help you. I think there's a lot more people that are interested in this than you would imagine. Um, I personally prefer microdosing LSD compared to mushrooms. I mm. just, I find that Why? when I'm with people, ah. I find that acid is much better with people with, when I'm doing mushrooms, I like to be outside more yeah. working. There's a little bit more of like, how do you say like a body type high? Like mm-hmm. you feel it more like a little bit, like you could take a nap almost and slow down. Whereas you know, with microdosing and I haven't done a full acid trip ever. I, I'd be open to it, but I haven't. Um, but it was funny, a, a buddy of mine in Toronto, um, was like, Hey, do you want to microdose LSD? I was like, well, I had this lunch meeting in like two hours. He was like, you'll do, you'll be way better. Yeah. So I'm like, all right, whatever, let's do it. <laughs> and I accidentally took a lot more than I probably should have. And so that, cause I could, there was more visuals. I went for a walk for an hour around Toronto and, and just saw like you, the trees were like alive. Like you could just, the colors were like so vibrant. Right. Um, but during that meeting, it was really interesting. I think for people that kind of lack, and I'm not saying that I'm a pro with this, but lack a little bit of like empathy or the ability of like emotional intelligence, like I could yeah. immediately, right when we sat down, I could immediately feel their energy and like their objections. And so I was able to like navigate the conversation in ways that I normally would just kind of push through, you know, and just like push my agenda where I was really kind of like, okay, they want to do business, but like, what are the hurdles? What are they really looking for? I was able to just like get there really quick. And it was like a really good meeting. They're like, oh, you should come back. Like, this is great. We'll do business together and all this. And I I called my buddy afterwards. I was like, oh my gosh, you're never going to believe this, you know? And he was laughing his butt off. But yeah, so I think, and since then, I, I, I was thinking about this. Like I haven't ever... I used to really like wine. Like I would drink sometimes a bottle a night or bottle and a half. Um, when I was writing this book, Belly Fat Effect in 2013, like that was my routine is I would just stay up all night, research, read, and get into this weird flow state, like yeah. two in the morning, whatever. Oh, yeah. But I, I have, like, I still enjoy wine, but it's, I never, I don't find myself getting drunk, like, or seeking that, getting into that state anymore. And I was trying to think, was well, it, I've been taking CBD, I've been meditating, I've been doing a lot of things, right? But it's, it's kind of interesting to not, have this anchor and ball to something, whether it's fast food or, or whatever for people. So I, I, I think it, there's a lot of applications, right? And so yeah. what, what caused that? I'm not really sure, but yeah. Yeah. Cool. There's, there's the, the, the applications are, are immense and, and the, I, it's interesting. The distinction between acid, which is, you know, a chemical substance that's manufactured versus a natural thing that's just growing out of, you know, dung mm-hmm. that you find underneath, you know, cedar trees, that it makes sense that you would want to be outside. Right. It, it makes sense that you would want to be around the trees. You know, um, um, th- there's another a, a Terrence McKenna quote um, that is, uh, "The plants are talking to us. This is not a euphemism. Mm. Like th- it is a different type of intelligence. It is a different type of of sentience that we coincide with. That we are in connection with, and." I'm with you there. The, the, the acid, the experience in, in, in microdosing acid is more like uh, prefrontal for me. It's more, it's more focused. It's more um, navigational. It's maybe less grounded. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I, it, it, the, the, I think about how people can, how people can seek this out. And that's what you said was really great advice. Like, if you're interested in these sorts of things, if you are interested in expanding your mind and expanding your consciousness and growing as a person outside of the prescription drugs 
um, or CrossFit, not to knock either of those. Yeah. I mean, it is what it is. But if, if you, you should go to a book reading, you should go to a float center, you should go to um, a dance hall, you know, you should go to a festival and just be around these sorts of people that, that are, that are, that are way ahead of it. And that have been trying for a while, you know, like the, the, everything that we're, that's sort of coming into popularity in the Western world around, you know, um, psychedelics and stuff like that, they've, they've been applied for thousands of years, you know, shaman eating Amanita muscaria mushrooms in Mongolia, you know, the red and white mushroom that's synonymous with like Santa Claus and Christmas. Mm. Like they would, they knew that they knew that thousands of years ago. You know, um, you mentioned ayahuasca, you know, that, that plant intelligence that's used in a ceremonial setting to get you into an altered state of consciousness where you can learn something where you can actually like improve a little bit. It's, it's, a, it's available. It's out there. And you have to ask yourself, why am I after this? What about this is interesting to me? What do I want to get out of it? Being intentional about where you're going and what you hope to learn about yourself and your life and your trajectory should be first and foremost. What am I doing? Because it is, it is a cognitive enhancer. I mean, um, microdosing, um, uh, psilocybin for an extended period of time is going to help you focus in a new way. You know, it helps you write a book that, that, that is, that's a cool, I think that's a cool story. I think that's awesome. Yeah. I mean, it's, I've noticed that I, I speak a lot slower in a more deliberate way. Like if you go back to my, you know, when I first started podcasting, I would talk really fast like this and I felt like I had to get everything out. And, and now it's like, I don't feel like I need to do that. You know, maybe I was trying to prove something or whatever, but it just comes across as this frenetic energy. Um, yeah. So I, what I'm trying to say is there's a lot of carry over here and, and I used to get a lot of, not to talk about me the whole time, but it's just one real kind of practical application, you know, as we film this in January, it's really dark, especially in Seattle. Right. Um, I used to be scared of the winter. I was like, Oh my gosh. Like, and this is, I moved to Colorado after college. We both went to Western Washington and Bellingham, you know, it gets dark in Bellingham and all that. And I used to be really scared of the winter and I would have this anticipatory anxiety about how I could get depressed or I could get this or that. And since microdosing, it's like pff, winter, summer, whatever. Like I just have to be present and it doesn't scare me. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think there, there's so many benefits and I don't know that a prescription SSRI is going to have that long lasting restorative resolution that something like this, that inherently kind of builds more presence and bakes more presence into your brain or more awareness. Right. So, yeah. and, if, cool. and, and if you're already fasting, you know, intermittent fasting and you're getting all the nutrients that you need and I mean, take care of that stuff first, yeah, right? Totally. Like, you know, fill your body with the nutrients that it needs to perform, get the right amount of sleep, like go outside and stand outside, um, barefoot, go on walks after dinner. Like you do, yeah. you know, like that stuff is fundamental. And then once that stuff is sort of organized, then look into these new, these, these, these other alternatives that can, that, that, I mean, it can happen so quickly. It can literally change your life and, and, and bring you into the sort of person that you want to be in yeah. a pretty short period of time. Totally. Yeah. And one last little anecdotal kind of sidebar comment. Um, my wife has done a, just a little bit of microdosing mushrooms, but we would do this on a Sunday and she was like, well, I think I should eat because it's like when I normally eat, but I'm not hungry. And now, and she, that really like helped to reconnect the cephalic phase of digestion for her and like connect with true hunger because she was like, she realized like, wow, I was one of these people that like, I felt like you know, at two o'clock or whatever, where her feeding window was at that time. This was a few years ago. But I think a lot of people, they're not really hungry, but they think they should eat because it's going to rev up their metabolic flame or do whatever it is. They have these ideas around it. And so just becoming more aware has a lot of carryover with yeah. that. Um, well, Sean, we could talk all day, I'm sure, on these <laughs> topics, but um, we have a few final questions we have to ask every guest that comes on the podcast. And you're a big person about routines. Um, I know you're pretty probably intentional about how you structure your day. Mm -hmm. Um, can you kind of walk us through like the first couple hours of like how you start your day? Yeah. So I wake up to a six year old and a three year old every single morning at either six ten or six fifteen. Uh, I get up. Um, I, well, what I do to start the morning is I take a couple of deep breaths. I think of one thing that I'm grateful for. I change it up every single day. Sometimes it's family, sometimes it's a home, sometimes it's a healthy body, sometimes it's, you know, a gift I got for Christmas. Uh, I think of one thing that I'm grateful for. I ask my kids for one thing that they're grateful for. 
uh, and then we go downstairs. I make coffee. Um, I haven't been doing the the um, fatty coffee for a while. Um, How come? Um, actually, so I've been eating keto for you know, I guess four years now, intermittent fasting for th- two or three, and um, I was in an ayahuasca ceremony. And, uh, the shaman came up and said, there's something going on with your stomach. There's something down here. That's like, it's heavy. It's heavy. And I was like, well, I don't really know what that is. And then I didn't really think about it. And she, and, and she goes, it's, you've got to, you've got to get this figured out. Like you're, you're kind of bogged down down there. And so I sort of decided to switch it up and tinker around. I still ate keto. I've sort of gravitated more towards like kind of carnivore based now. Um, so I basically just eat meat and vegetables. I've, I don't, I don't double down on the fat. So, uh, I don't, I don't do the butter coffee. I just do, um, a really high quality coffee. I'm drinking this coffee called purity coffee. Mm. Um, it's really well tested. Uh, it's got low mycotoxins. Uh, it's a really high quality coffee. So I'll drink that. I'll make breakfast for the kids. Um, every single, every single morning, every morning, no cereal, mm. no waffles. Like I make breakfast, nice. right? Like bacon and eggs most days and, uh, feed the kids. I get them ready for school. Um, and then, um, we sit and read a book, take them to school. We come back and then that's when my work day starts. So at like eight forty five is when I sit down and, uh, and then I work really hard focused from eight forty five until 1230. We have to go back and get my daughter. Um, and then as a coach, my schedule is really highly variable. You know, I'm as a coach and podcaster, like I kind of got to pick and choose, but that's how I, that's, that's my morning routine. That's awesome. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so you jump right into dad mode right away and got to yeah. tackle that. Yeah. yeah I'm yeah. blessed. My, my kid likes to sleep. Well, you're big into nootropics and different supplements. Yeah. You know, if you were just like, oh man, I can, oh, I'm going on this long trip. I can only have room for one thing. What are you bringing with you? Siltep for sure. Uh, natural stacks is, uh, the company that I work with th- through the podcast. Siltep it's all natural. It's open source. It's third party lab tested on every batch. And it is, you know, I've, I went through racetams and provigils and alpha brains before I found Siltep and it's, it acts quickly. It lasts a long time and isn't habit forming. Mm. Um, so Siltep for me is, is, is my favorite all time, all time nootropic, That's cool. um, better memory, better recall, higher focus and, and longer term focus, more endur- mental endurance. Hmm. I'll have to read yeah. what's in it. Like well, a quarantine. It's you- uh, a foriolus, uh, uh, scoliolus for scoli artichoke extract. I think there's alpha GPC in it and then there's, there's only four ingredients. So it's, there's something and it's all, it's all, um, disclosed. So yeah, yeah. everyone can see it. it's not like a bundled into a proprietary blend. Yeah. Um, when I see that I'm frustrated. It's yeah. like, come on. Right. Yeah. I mean, cause there is no real intellectual property on dietary supplements. So a lot of people can just knock off. So I understand why companies do that, but right. Yeah, it is kind of interesting. Um, so kind of final question here. I mean, we have a big healthcare epidemic, you know, in the US and now abroad. Um, if you could influence or had ideas to influence us from top down, obviously, I think it'll be probably a grassroots effort that will change how people eat and move and all that. What would you want to say to a politician as a way to maybe influence healthcare policy or, or government spending? What do you think? Yeah. After my episode with Dr. Anthony J about estrogenic chemicals, I think to have the greatest impact, um, it would be to drastically regulate plastics and aromas. This is, this is, I think a major, major issue for people and they don't really think about it. So many people drink water out of a disposable water bottle and not only is that terrible for the environment, but the the estrogenic effect that that has in your body is um, is something that's not really widely talked about, and it's something that we have to take really seriously. Um, it's screwing with people's hormones. It's screwing with sperm count. Like the sperm count now of men in their 30s is half of what it was of their grandfathers. Um, there's infertility. There's early... Um, puberty in 
boys and girls. Um, there's gynecomastia, which is basically man boobs from guys and from guys eating the impossible burger and spraying cologne and washing their hair with herbal essence shampoo and just, just bathing in chemicals all day long. And it's really screwing with people. So I think that when it comes to the regulation to, to, from the top down, I think that it would have, it would have to be to take a really hard look at, at the chemicals Monsanto included uh, that that are that are affecting our food and affecting the uh, the consumables that we uh, that we consume every day. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, I mean they're just ubiquitous. I mean they're everywhere. Yeah. I travel a lot, and in every hotel or Airbnb that I've ever been in, outside of maybe one Airbnb, there's the parabens and the the different scents that you were talking about, and the other persistent organic pollutants that are in just common everyday products. I mean hand soap, shampoos, you name it, cleaning products, and I think a lot of people, they haven't unfortunately gotten this message. I mean, for you and I, we're like, yeah, we don't buy soaps with this stuff. But I think a lot of people, do, they go to Target, Walmart, Costco, just get whatever's there. They don't think about it because these are major brands. You, like, how could a big soap company like Dial be putting in something that's going to cause me to be infertile, right? It, yeah. That, it seems right. like unfathomable. You're like, well, for sure these companies would test this stuff. I mean, come on. You, I mean, that's like the common thinking, but it's not really the case. But. No. Yeah. It's crazy, Sean. What are we gonna do, man? I think we got to keep talking about it. Yeah, we got. I mean, it's it. It is. It is. You're right. It has to come from the bottom up. It has to be from people like yourself. And and let me shine a little light on you. Your content is so great and it's so consistent and it's so clear that you live it every day. I mean, walking into a, like a modified log cabin with a wood fi- <laughs> wood burning fire behind yeah. me. I mean, this you're you're living it. You know, talking about headlamps for night walks after dinner and getting your steps in it, you're in super inspiring and so that is what it's going to take i believe is more and more conversations like this like we have to take it upon ourselves to keep talking about this because we are going to be the change makers in this thing so i'm honored to be here i'm super excited to to have this conversation and and uh, go float for sure, man. Let's go do it. So um, if folks want to connect with you, what's the best online resource? Yeah. The best place to find me is uh, seanmccormick.com, S-E-A-N McCormick, um, or on my U- YouTube channel, Sean McCormick. Cool. And uh, Instagram, it's real Sean McCormick. Nice. And uh, the podcast that I host is the Optimal Performance Podcast, which you have appeared on. So your, yeah. your, uh, your audience is going to like that episode. That was fun. And let's give a shout out to Nancy Carpenter, who introduced us. And yes. you guys met at a conference? Was We did. Yeah. We met at a um we met at a conference a workshop by the spiritual channel paul selig Mm. paul selig is a is a spiritual medium who channels um um entities and has written seven books about it um he's one of the four one of the foremost um intuitive practitioners on the planet and i just uh, happened to run into nancy so funny (laughs) that's so cool yeah so is is intuition teachable yes Mm. Yes, it is. Cool. We are. We all have that ability, and, and it's it's something that I don't talk about very much because mm. it freaks people out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? yeah. But um, it's an important part of my life, and it's something that I've cultivated, and that I've helped other people cultivate as well. Like sort of in, in, intuitive ability. You know, you talked about having that sense of of reading energy in a room when you were uh, microdosing mm-hmm. um, acid. We, we all can do that. We all can pick up on those subtle cues and there's practices and approaches to be able to do that. But yeah, we've all, we've all got it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I think there's that part of our subconscious or whatever that says like, Oh, you're going to be wrong this time or, or whatever. Like, it, like we, we tune it down. Like we turn the knob down when we should be paying attention to it. Yeah. Yeah. You so got to trust your gut. Right. Yeah. You're, it's almost always right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. There were, I can't remember what study it was, but there was, there was a group of individuals where they, randomized people to meet a roommate for the first time. It was a college students and they knew right away with within 15 seconds, whether or not they would be compatible. Huh. Right. I can't remember how they structured it or set it up, but it was a really interesting study. I, I can't remember what book it was. I think it was it, one of these, um, you know, social science books that I read oftentimes. And I thought that was pretty interesting because we meet someone right and we can kind of pick up on some things and yeah, we ignore it. Um, but, but I think that's, that's pretty cool that they, you help teach people that. Because- yeah. It, 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 and, and it may no, be no surprise, but that ability to develop your, literally your sort of spidey sense mm-hmm. comes from a place of stillness. You have to cultivate that quietly by yourself. And you can't do it watching Dancing with the Stars. You have to do it 
meditating or or in a float tank, walking outside. Like there are ways to do it, but it's not going to be done when you're distracted. Scrolling through Instagram. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Cool. Let's yeah. go float, Sean. Thanks yeah. for coming on. Thanks for having me. Cool.